Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hey, welcome, welcome very much. It's an honor it's to have you here. You are the top Serbian streamer, we can say that. Without too uh, much. I don't like to talk big about myself. I would say I'm average at the moment. I think it's, I was just going to say it's you're the top streamer because you're the only one, but. You can uh, leave that. Uh, the okay. Serbian, top Serbian. Top Serbian, top Serbian, maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not tell people that you're the only one, so they think you're really good. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we are going to say we, I'm the best, and if you want to like catch up some Serbia streamer, you, you should watch me rather than others, because <laughs> there is no no other. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I've, I've been wanting to talk for you for some time. You are a Magic the Gathering limited player, and I really appreciate your drafting style. I, I'm really admiring of how you communicate your thoughts very clearly, like you were very talkative during your stream, you you explain your reasoning very well, and I think you have quite a different approach from other streamers. You, you often explore your own methods and you do your own decisions that are not necessarily the same as what the mainstream or the meta is. And you still have a lot of success with it, so mm -hmm. a lot of respect, and at the same time I think it also speaks of the beauty of Draft, of Limited, being that people with different approaches can be successful in different ways, and there is not yeah, one solution ever. So, just to, for people who don't know you very well, would you like to explain your context of, of your background in magic and maybe your achievements in Magic Arena specifically? Okay, so I started playing magic like in 2008 or 2009, I'm not quite sure. It was, I think, Shazo Alara or Conflux. I remember the first set that. I did go for pre-release for Zendika, so like people that are old school will know when I did start playing Magic. So, like that's the time when I stopped playing Magic. After that, like I did take a break during the Phyrexia, and then in 2017, like I started playing a bit again. Um, and then in 2018, I did play Nationals, got qualified to the World Cup representing Serbia. Uh, at that moment, Arena was on, so I didn't have like. A, a lot of time maybe practicing in real life, so I was using Arena as the practice tool and getting ready for the World Cup. Uh, unfortunately, the World Cup, we didn't qualify for day two. We were like one win away. We were like oh. even a split away from like, like it was super close for us to qualify for the day two, but it was a great experience. That was my, like, my, my first time like leaving the country and actually getting to see what the competitive magic really is, right? One is LGS, one is when you go outside yes. your country and and actually do get to play the game which you love with the other people and it's like a wonderful, wonderful experience. Especially in a big happy. city for the first time. The first time yeah, you leave your country, so everything must be new and amazing. And I, I had the pleasure to go to Barcelona and we did talk like I, I'm like a huge, huge fan of Barcelona. I would go again, like just not focus about the magic when I get to Barcelona, but focus about everything you can see there, like Sagrada or whatever, like even the parks, like I love, I love the parks there. Yeah. But let's get back to the topic. So um, at that time I started playing Arena and around 2019, I think that's the moment when the COVID started, unfortunately, I was working like two jobs and I was figuring out how can I work from home. And since I know like people are streaming, I was like, hey, why not like, try something new, like I like challenges and I like uh, getting better at maybe even playing more Magic. So started playing Limited, at the time I started I was like uh, 10k gems, like that was the amount of gems I did build up. And every time I did start the stream, I was always feeling uh, scared of losing the gems because like, I'm gonna start playing more, I'm not like playing one draft on day, I'm gonna play like three or four. And then like if I start losing on stream, it's gonna like end up on like losing all my gems and if I lose all my gems how am I gonna play limited because I don't have like financials to like play and pl pl pay and play limited so luckily enough it was Zendikar and Zendikar was one of my favorite sets mm -hmm. in like last couple of sets um, and I was okay in the set I don't know what my win rate was back back then but I think it was quite high since like until the end of the Zendikar, I was like sitting at 80k gems or something like that. So 80k I, I, gems? Yeah, yeah, How do you even gems. accumulate so many to begin with? Okay, do, do you have the idea how much I have now? Since like uh, Zendikar, I, th I think it was like one and a half years away. I think you have around four, four, 400 k No, no, I, I'm close, so close, 385. Oh yeah, around. <laughs> okay. So yeah, and then I never did Whoa. invest in magic in a way of like 
paying the jam so I can play. I was always trying to earn them. And yeah, by playing the traditional, traditional has the best uh, reward system what I did have. Like you were getting the double amount if you do go 3-0. and And I did realize that and then I was just focusing on that. By the time of playing, I was trying to realize how can I get better and like what can I learn. Since when I started playing Limited, I had like my way of looking at it. I never did read an article. I was just like trying to figure out the basic stuff on my own. And then like knowledge was like building up, experience was building up during the play. And then the gem count was just going higher and higher. And now like hopefully I'm not going to run out now. Like I am going to have... Uh, a, a long, long time until I reach the zero point again. I think you have enough gems for your kids to play and go zero free in every draft, and they still have dr drafts for like one year or two. <laughs> I, I think somebody did calculate like if I play like two or three events and go like zero three, like I have for like eight months or something like that. Okay, so, so you you basically went infinite in drafting from one mm -hmm. hand to two. So you made enough gems to buy the next event and accumulate some more. So you were yeah. self-sustainable. In this way. Yes. So you, always try, trying to get at least, which was two and one. Like if you're two and one, you're like uh, minus on the gems. Like you do get the minus mm -hmm. 500, but you do get max. And then like when you go three and oh, you get a double. So like the whole point is like, I'm not sure which win rate you're aiming for, but like maybe around like 70%, 65. I think like that's the amount of win rate you need to go infinite. And which rank do you usually hit on Arena? Um... I'm totally against the rank. That's like a interesting topic because like I, I'm not a believer that magic should be played in best of one. So if like if there is supposed to be a ranking, a ranking in the way that we can play best of three and then we have three matches and then we can actually go for ranking. Uh, I do rank up for one reason because I want to play the tournaments. There is the qualifier weekend happening every month. And when I do want to play it, I was aiming to get to Mythic and to tap top 1200. So how was my way of approaching that, I get to Mythic, and when I get to Mythic, I end up in, like, top 50, because I end, like, getting Mythic in, like, first week. And then after that, by not playing, I end up in top 1200, because your rank doesn't go up or down. But if you so play like, Limited, isn't best of three also counting the progress towards the rank? Or is it no, best of unfortunately, one? Unfortunately oh, not. Oh, just best of one. That's best of okay, one, yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's, a, that's the thing that the Limited community is always, like, Hoping that they're gonna like give us to play best of three rank. Like I, I would not leave the ladder if that was that was a thing. Like I would literally non-stop play best of three ranked rather than playing a casual. Like at the moment I'm playing casual limited because it's not ranked. You can play against somebody that's totally new, but you can play like against the other grinder, which is like just Lolaman or some other yeah. like a really, really great limited player. And that's like that that's the unique thing. Like for me, like I always say. You can end up in playing against the average player in best of three, but the one time when you play against the grinder or you play against somebody that is really skilled, you're going to learn more by playing best of three matches because there is cyborg involved. You actually know against you what you're playing, and there isn't like much variance. There is still variance in magic. We cannot deny that. But like it's way less because you have some information, you have some knowledge you can use as your tool against them. So would so, you say that you favor always best of three in terms of how exactly. magic should be played and how yeah, the game should be played and the complexity that the limited mirrors? Yeah, I mean, like, if you do check the competitive events, none, none of the competitive events are best of one, right? right? So it just doesn't make sense for me that best of one limited is, ma is ranked and the best of three is not, but, like, that's how they decided. They're, they're, there is a reason, I guess. Maybe they wanted the best of three to be for more casual players, but... Luckily enough, I guess, if it is luckily, uh, best of three has the best reward system, and I, I love playing best of three. Cyborg is a big part of magic, if I'm asked. Maybe, maybe one of the, one of the bigger parts of magic, like learning to cyber. Like one thing is to play the game. Second is to have the tools and have the knowledge how to cyber in against your opponent. Uh, getting back to the top, uh, getting yeah, about back to the topic, top, about the sideboard topic. Would you say that the sideboard in drafting is complex and complete enough? to make these decisions really matter. Because if you have a sideboard in Constructor, okay, you can choose 15 cards from a pool of nearly, let's say, infinite, because it's a whole sample of cards available in a certain format. But in drafting, you like you, sometimes you have trouble making your own deck, and maybe you have three, four, five extra picks that you could swap 
according to some matchups. So you think that those few peaks, let's say they are few or assume they are few, are enough mm -hmm. to add this layer of complexity that you are seeking? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, taking a moment to take a cyber card definitely improves the win rate if you know that you're going to end up in, having a chance to board that card in. Like, comparing Constructed to Limited, like, the thing about Constructed and the cyber is, like, you choose which 15 cards you like against the decks that are maybe bad matchups and you want to improve them, right? That's the logic behind the Constructed and the cyber. In Limited, you're kind of doing the same. You're taking a chance to take a card like, for example, Broken Wings, which, which you would not want to have main board. That's the card destroys that I'm saying. Flying for destroys the destroys flying, is. destroys, like, uh, I think, uh, artifact like enchantment. Yes. Yeah, so, like, that's a card that you don't want to maybe put in, in your main board. I mean, depends on the set. Like, maybe if the, if the set is, like, a lot of flyers and you know that uh, that card, like, can, can kill, like, 50% of the set, sure, you can maybe play it main board. But that's, like, a perfect example of the card that can help you improve your sideboarding in, like seeing what your opponent is playing and then like deciding which cards are maybe going to perform better or not. Uh, for previous set, there were like a lot of examples for those cards. Like there was the lucky offering, one mana white, destroy target artifact uh, that costs three or less, gain three life. Yes. That's a card that you maybe don't want to like put in your main board because like if it ends up in your opponent not playing artifact, that's a dead card, that's a minus one card. And if I'm as limited is about resources as well. Like you don't want to like two for one yourself a lot you want to two for one your opponent because like if you end up having that value it's gonna pile up and if you have a lot of more uh card advantage it's gonna maybe end up in winning you the game so uh having a kill spell for one why that does deal with some decks and against other decks it's maybe not the best it's like a great cyber tool that you can actually board in uh one of the things that i love doing in the cyborg is like for people that maybe are don't have many experience in cyborging uh, I would advise them to like look at a few things. First thing that you want to remember, that this is like a thing that my captain told. Uh, the person that was my captain in my national team. He was like giving me a lot of tips in limited because he's like a, maybe the best Serbian limited player, if, if not the best. Uh, so he did Wait, tell what, me like... Sorry, what how, is his name? Just to help people know. He's uh, Alex Atelaro. Okay. So yeah. what did he tell you? So he told me, like, uh, when it comes to, like, limited, which cards you want to remember after seeing game one? You usually do want to end up in remembering the tricks. Tricks are the important one. Because tricks end up in, like, two for one in you, or, like, maybe even two for one in them, if you can play around them. So, like, the tricks are the cards that are removals, combat tricks, like, whatever that is not a creature, you want to remember them as much as you can, if you can. Like, you want to remember as, how does their removal perform against your deck and then what can you do you can maybe add some tricks that can play around their tricks uh for example there is the two mana sacrifice a creature draw two cards that's a great card that can be cast when they cast a removal against your creature because you get a plus one out of that you sacrifice a creature you use a card you get two new they lose a card so you're plus one there so like that's a card that you can maybe board in if you see an opponent having a lot of removals, but maybe that's not a card to board in immediately in your deck and play at main board because sacrificing a creature after block is not the same as maybe after they them using a removal. So uh, the other the other way around, sorry to interrupt, it'll be also like if you have an enchantment on a creature, like let's say in this set, uh, which is Streets of New Capena, Sticky Fingers, so an enchantment that you place in your creature that adds value if you attack or if you deal damage. If the opponent has a lot of removal, you probably want to also side that out. Cyber, yeah. If you uh, you can keep that card. That card is interesting because uh, for the opponent to like outvalue you that, they need to have an early removal, and the early removal has to be instant because like when the creature does die, you still get to draw a card. So you don't lose the value from the sticky figure, and if they cast the removal on your creature, it's still one for one. Uh, yes. But yeah, uh, getting back to the cyborging, what what one thing that I did learn as well. Uh, some cards that are maybe the creatures that aren't the best or like they are not the, the ones that do end up in your deck, they're like 24, 25th best creature. Again, some matches they might be the best. And why is that? Because their power and toughness um, does end up in playing really good against their deck. Like if you see an opponent having a lot of shock effects, like they have one mana two damage, and you sideboard out every creature that does have two toughness and you board every creature that has like three toughness, if you can, if you can do that, then you make their removal bad because 
their removal is never one for one. They have to like either block or they have to assign one more damage in order of killing your creature. So like seeing those base damage removal, you can board in the creatures in a way that you can play around the removals or even better, play around the combat. You can see their creature. That's like a next step. You remember how their creatures are aligned. Like if you see a lot of their creatures having two power, one toughness, you can either board three toughness or one power creatures that are maybe not the best, like... I don't know, like a one drop that does have some value, which maybe is not going to be a main boardable card. Now it can be because it's going to trade with their th th the three drop. So like there is a lot of things you can use as your knowledge after seeing a game one and like boarding in correctly against them. That's very interesting because you really focus on many details. It's not just about uh, you have many removal, I will put uh, more creatures or less enchantments, but you really focus on the numbers and focus how your mm -hmm. numbers match the numbers of your creature match the numbers of their removal, so that's very detailed. Yeah, uh, so, right. like, I, I think, like, those basic things, we can call them basic cyborging. Right. I tools. also... Yeah, so, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, yeah, so those basic cyber tools do, I think, improve your win rate, because if you can make your combat better, and if you can make them, like, two for one, you're gonna, like I said, win, because if you're not getting flooded or screwed, you're gonna win because you're getting a lot of bonus one cards, which you maybe are not gonna get if you have the same creatures. Uh, this sounds great, but would you say that during a draft you get enough picks to make these choices? Because it seems like luxury to have a creature with free toughness if they're shocks for two damage and things like this. Sometimes you barely make the deck or you yeah, don't yeah. have many options. So can you usually afford this flexibility? Uh, so it depends on the draft. Like I would say it depends on like um, what position of the draft you are. Are you like at the beginning where you're trying to find the lane? If that's the case, you don't want to be taking cyber cards, you want to be focused about your main board. But when it comes to like the creatures that you were saying that I'm boarding in, usually you end up in like having a pick 13, pick 12, whatever, if you're in open colors, you're going to end up in getting some creatures which are not going to play, but they might end up in like being the best. Uh, for one example, in this set, the green card, four mana, one four toughness. So one four, on the tap, it makes the treasure. So maybe that card is not doing nothing for you. Like you're an aggressive deck or I don't know, you're a mid-range deck yeah. and you don't like that four drop. But you see their deck and you see their creatures are a lot three or or I, I don't know, X one. Mm -hmm. And then you just board that guy in because that guy is a huge wall. Yes. And he's going to like provide you the combat being better for you because they cannot attack into, the, into him. And that's like a bad card to use a removal. But if they want to pass, they kind of have to use a removal or a trick. So, like, those are the cards that you do end up in having. Like, creatures are usually the cards that you don't end up in playing, but, like, keep an eye on their power and toughness because they might actually be, be better than some other that yeah. you're playing. This is very interesting uh, to me because I usually play best of one, mm -hmm. in part because of the reward structure. I feel that to go infinite or get your payback in best of three, you need to be really good. You need to reach consistently, consistently at least two wins, and I feel I'm not good enough for that. So I usually focus on best of one, so the sideboard is not so much a consideration, just pick what I think that goes in the main deck. Or this is in the other edition, I would not take a lucky offering, because I knew it, I would never board it. Yeah. So if you draft in best of three and you have this sideboard mindset that you need to build a sideboard as complete as possible to give you the most options possible, at which point do you start to shift actively towards building the sideboard? Or do you just stay, like you say, just open to what the packs I mean, are? And yeah, just yeah. Go with so, it? so I would say that at the beginning of the draft, if you don't know your lane, you should never take a cyber card because like most important thing in the draft, at least for me, is finding the lane. Like it's either like okay. If you're force, forcing the draft, you know your lane. You're going to force it until the end, and you're going to cut the cards, you're going to pick them highly, you're going to get rewarded or not, depending on how your other people on the table are drafting them. For me, I'm like, I think this is Ben Stark school, like drafting, ha drafting the hard way, drafting what is open. And for me, like in pack one, I'm trying to get the information what is happening if I can, and know what, what the colors are seemingly coming to me and like what colors and cards are getting open and then if I'm in them I, I stay in them if not consider on switching or not uh, but for your question when it comes to the cyborg like you take the cyborg cards over the cards that you are most likely gonna end up in cutting so like if there is a card that like in the next two packs you're gonna end up in getting better ones and you're gonna 
end up in not needing it, and you already have enough playable cards, those are the moments when you take a chance to take a good cyborg card, because that card is gonna, in fact, uh, like, affect your win rate, uh, or having a good match. Uh, one of those cards, like, I have, like, some for this set as well, would be the two-mana black card that does say, uh, look at the opponent's hand, discard a creature or an enchantment, or the second part would be opponent sacrifices an enchantment. That's a great card that you can take during the draft, and the reason why it is, is because, A, you can see opponent having a lot of big, uh, costly creatures that are bombs, like for seven mana examples, mm -hmm. and then you can board in that, and you know that, like, even if you top deck that and you're in late game and he still hasn't get to seven mana, it's not gonna be dead, or even better. That's like, that's like a desperate move, boarding it for the creature. Better one would be boarding it to actually make them sacrifice an enchantment, because there is enchantment bombs, like, um... Uh, Fight rigging, uh, five mana white that does make the hideaway. All the hideaway enchantments are good. Enchantment removal, sleep with the fishes, uh, two mana, witness, uh, two mana, call for ransom, witness protection. All of those cards do deal with your creatures. And the ascendancy but then you, is also. Yeah, ascendancy. But then you board in the two mana hate that does work in the late game as well. So not, it's not a dead card. It's gonna work early game by you taking their creature and getting information, or either B. You're gonna make them sacrifice an enchantment, you're gonna get your creature back. Which they are gonna think that they removed it, because that card that they put in the deck, uh, the four mana slip with the fishes, is acting as a removal. So if they play those type of removal and you board in the card that does deal with that, most likely they have like few more removals, but like you have you have like dealt with a threat in a way that you got your back you you, you got your creature back. That's very interesting. And uh, talking about finding the open lanes, one thing that I noticed that you do and is extraordinarily interesting to me is that on pack one, pick one, usually, mm -hmm. you think very hard about the colors that you're passing and you speak them loud to you. You say, okay, I'm going to pick this. But before the timer runs out, you say, okay, there's three green cards, two red cards, uh, uh, three white yeah, cards. Yeah, yeah. So one, <laughs> one thing that strikes me, do you not use... 17 lands or the draft assistant on purpose uh yeah of course the uh, reason behind that is because i'm playing in real life and you don't have those things like helping you out right so in real life you don't have a, you cannot use the paper and like type in every card that yes. you did pass and like that there is not a helping tool in real life and if you want to get better in real life as well playing drafts you kind of have to remember as much as you can on the pack oh, okay so it's uh, practicing I, I, uh, other than that, uh, other than that, I actually think this as well. Uh, I think that if you actively try to remember as much as you can, you're you're having a better perspective of the draft rather than like uh, relying on uh, something else helping you out. Of course, something else helping you out will give you a clear picture, but you're not committed in it. You you're not putting your thought process on it. You you might not realize some things that you are realizing if you are remembering and trying to think as much as you can, like. Thinking is not bad. Like if you're playing the game, you're playing a, playing a thinking game. Why not like think a bit harder? And the reason why I'm like th th that's like my method. Uh, like pack one, pack pick one. Uh, since I say to myself like, what is like this is a thing that I did like learn and I did teach myself. Like this is not something that I did read or anything. This is like my method. Okay. And 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 I I was thinking like what what is the pack that you have perfect information? It has to be the pack you open. Every other pack that you get past, something is missing and you don't have the clear picture. So if you have the full information, why not try to remember it as much as you can, right? Remember the colors. Like, if you cannot remember every card, you can, like, in general, remember which card was, like, a bomb and, you know, like, people to your left are going to take. You can like, remember, like, there is a murder, right? There is a murder in the pack. Murder doesn't wheel. You're like, oh, I know murder is gone. Somebody did take it. It's logical, right? Yes. But what, what do I try to do is, like, you have the color you have the colors in the pack as well you have like three red cards three green three blue and then like i can see at least if i cannot remember the card like i'm trying to remember as much as i can i'm like learning this as well i'm not like master i'm not master at this like this is me learning still like uh trying to get better at this so what what do i do is i try to see uh how many colors were taken not the cards how many colors were taken and then like if I can remember after the colors, like I will see all three red cards are gone, can I remember if all three red cards were good? If they were not good, that tells me that they were just, uh, 
they're just like forcing the lane and they just want other people to not go for it. They're not gonna maybe take a good blue card. They're gonna take a red card and they're just like sending a signal, hey, I'm in red, don't go for it. Like it's not the best card in the pack. I'm gonna take it, don't go for it. And then like when I do get the pack back and that was the pack I have the full information about, I see how many colors were taken. And then like if I'm in green and I see one green card was gone, that's a good sign because that means that there is one more person of all the cards that did prioritize another green card. And if the pack had like five green cards and I know like four of them did wheel and I, I am in green, that's a good sign. Like I'm in a good color pair and that, this tells me like depending on what the colors, what the cards are. Like sometimes colors are wheeling, but the cards are bad and you cannot look that as a single. So uh, yeah, they, that's they, the thing, they, like, is this method reliable, or is the information that you get on pick 9, when you see the wheels from your first pick, is the information that you get actually reliable? Let's say people take free green cards, can you conclude that free people are on green, or can they uh, or no. change? Yeah. No, like the pack one, like I like to call it uh, the finding the round. You want to find the road in the pack one, you want to find the road, and then like pack two, stick to it. Pack three, finish the deck or like find your playables. So, like, the thing is, like, in the draft, people change. People change the direction. Even in the pack two, in the middle of the pack, you can change your direction. Yes. Especially in a format and, that has a lot of bombs, like was yeah. Vow and like it's kind of Streets of Nuka Pen. It has really powerful exactly. cards. People are going to pick a card. They're gonna find the lane. They're gonna open a new bomb, and they're gonna switch into play, trying to play that as well, which is totally legit. Like people should do that, unless, unless they are aggro deck maybe, and the lane they are in is maybe better to stick to it because like it, the deck is like already playing out, and you're maybe in the open colors. Um, but like it, it's it's like a double edged sword, I would say. Like you can use this information that you get, but you should not uh, take it for granted. Like, since, like, reading the table and signaling, there isn't, like, a definition to that. It's, like, every pod to itself. Because, like, you're not drafting with the same people and you cannot make a law. Like, every time you're entering with seven new people and you have to adapt to them. You have to adapt to their way of looking at the cards as well. You have to adapt to, what, what, like, what is happening and so on. So, for example, like, if I and you are drafting and you pass me some great green card, and I'm looking at that as a signal, maybe that pack had two good cards, and you, and you did take a card that I would value at lower, but you, you did take it because you maybe value it higher. And then, like, you have to pay attention to, to that as well. Are the signalings you're getting correct? Like, if you're seeing, like, three blue cards pass in a row that are great, most likely those three blue cards that were in the pack there weren't like two of them and like the person next to you that is sending the pack he wasn't taking the best one like he's every time passing you the best card that's a signal you enter in blue for example yes um i would say that information that you get from the colors depends on the wheel like sometimes you can take the information sometimes you cannot uh when do you take the information uh, you take the information when you do see a card and you and you think that the people left to you are going to take it as a pick two, pick three, or pick four. Like some people, three of you are going to take it as a pick two, pick three, pick four. And then somehow that card wheels. What okay. do you do then? So, so it's, like that card, so that it's card like did like... The more priority or the more value assigned to a card, if that card wheels, the more value mm -hmm. you place on it, it means that the higher chances of that lane being very open are. Yeah, there, there, there is a chance of that lane being open. The thing is, like like I said, you don't have the information about the pack, right? Every pack that is passed, right. you don't have the information. Every time one card is gone, two cards is gone, three cards is gone, and so on. But the pack that you have full information is your pack. And you want to, like, master that pack. You want to be uh, the person that does know everything, and you want to use the knowledge that you have about that pack. So... The thing that, I, like, this happened to me, and, and I, I, I remember this draft by, like, details. So, I started a draft, and I passed, like, three or four green cards. Uh, let's say three. Let's say three. Three is, three is an easier number. And I did take, like, for example, red card. And then people were passing me blue cards. I haven't seen any green card until the pick eight. Pick eight, I did see, like, some golden, maybe green card. And then pick nine, all three green cards wield. 
And what do you get from that information? Can you tell me what do you get from like all three green cards? And like, let's say the two of those were strong. Two yeah, of well, the green that's cards. That's the point. So two were pickable or very desirable pickable, to yeah. pickable. It's mixed. So you have two hypotheses. Either someone was taking all the green cards or the packs that they opened didn't have any green cards to begin with, which is very unlikely. So uh, based on the probability, okay. I will assume that someone was taking the green cards because what are the chances of people opening eight packs and or seven packs and having almost no green? Okay, okay. Here's the thing that you maybe don't know, and this is like a thing that we're gonna get to. Like I, I wanted because like this is a good time to like share the knowledge, share the opinions, and I'm gonna like teach you maybe something that you didn't know, and I'm maybe gonna teach somebody else. Yep. So here's the thing: every pack in a common slot he has to have every color. Oh. You cannot open you cannot open a pack, and in the pack not having a green card. There has to be always one. Minimum one, because some packs Mi have minimum. really almost nothing of one color, but almost no, nothing is no. one then. Yeah, yeah, almost nothing is one. Like, that card is unplayable, you scratch it in your brain like, ah, oh, <laughs> Something like, there's nothing. That, that, that card, there's, there's nothing. But in the pack, which you open, okay, okay. in common slots, there has to be at least one of that color representing. And that's a key, because like, like I said, I was drafting. And I didn't see any green card. I, I was solving green cards, but those cards were like cyborg pickable cards. And I'm not going to take a cyborg card and say, like, I'm going to jump into green. And then the three cards did wheel, and all of those green cards were playable. And I was like, okay, no one is drafting green because every other pack that I have seen didn't have anything in green, and green didn't seem great. And then my pack wheeled, and my pack had the green cards. Then I did pick the green card. After that, all the other green cards did wheel, and those were cyborg cards, and I was taking them. And after that, pack two and pack three, all the green cards were passed to me because I got the information and the table did wheel me all the good cards. And I got rewarded for reading the table. And how did I read the table? I just remembered my pack as much as I can. I didn't remember the cards by heart. Like, if you ask me, can you, can you like, say every 15 cards in the pack? I cannot. I'm a human. Like, let's be honest. You but are. what can I do? <laughs> I am, I am. But, but what can I do? I can at least remember the colors. And the cool thing about magic is, like, it's hard to remember the colors if you assign the color to a number. Like, if you say five red, four green, three blue, two white, one black, it's hard to remember. How I try to do, I try to find the groups. So I try to say, like, bunt, three. And what does the bunt mean? Bunt means green, blue, white. So I have three colors assigned with one name, with one number. And then like if the, if the bond colors had like two blue cards, I say bond three with two blue. So I try okay. to remember with less words the most information, information as well. So like I, I usually try to use the three school cards like bond, Greeks, I don't know, Jund, and then like two color Azorius or something like that. And then you remember Artifact and Lens. So you want to try to make uh -huh. as, as many informations uh, with least possible words that does describe the whole pack, right? Yes, that's very, that's so interesting. It's the first time I hear someone taking this approach and I think that the outcome can either be be two. Either you develop a spectacular memory or you fail spectacularly because it's just too much information to absorb. But I would Definitely. say that at the beginning is probably overwhelming, but I think that even for your brain, it's an amazing exercise. And you probably see it, it, improvement over time. It, 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 over time, you see a lot of improvement. Like, like I said, you can use 70 lands, you can use any other deck trap. I highly advise you to use that if you want. But you are more into the game and you're more like uh, getting information if you are developed to the draft. Yes. If you are trying to think like trying to think is better than like having one person assigned to drafting and one person assigned to remembering like those two don't like meet up in a way that they have the same knowledge but if you have one person trying to do the same he should maybe be better but maybe not i i think like over the time he's not gonna be i mean at the beginning he's not gonna be better but over the time he is because he's trying to master two things at the one time i like but a at lot the beginning, I like a lot that mm -hmm. mindset. Uh, I think I will start doing it, not only because it's good for your brain, but also because I like the idea of not depending on third-party software. 
So you become yeah. more reliable in yourself. You become probably more confident and say, I can do this. I don't need to depend on others. And that's probably empowering once you are yeah. able to remember it properly. And one thing like that does happen is, as well, like there is train wrecks. Like there, there, there are drafts that just like end up in like you not knowing what happened. And then like when you're trying to remember, it's hard to remember when the train wreck did happen. And that's when the 70 lens is good, since like you can like analysis when the train wreck did happen. So I love the 70 lens. 70 lens is the best like application you can use for like drafting and like getting the information. Like there is percentages, there is like your win rate, you can see your color bias, you can see a lot of information. Sorry. And 17 lens, don't get me wrong, I'm using it as well, but I'm using it the other way. I'm using it in the way that I'm gonna like check my draft logs in a way I can like reanalyze the draft again if I did something bad. What can what could have I done differently? If nothing, I say to myself, this was just a train wreck. In a way that I have done the best I can, but there wasn't a better lane. And what can I do? Like those things do happen and you have to like um be judgmental towards yourself but like try to not be too hard on yourself as well like, sometimes the draft is like that and like you could have not done anything better do you feel that uh, the fact that you have insight information changes your perspective on how you have evaluate certain picks this for me tends to be something that i have some trouble differentiating at the time i feel like the pick is correct but then the fact that you know what you're going to open on pack two and three puts the first pick into perspective and you say subconsciously let's say you open a bomb in pack two you say maybe i should have gone to the green pack or the green pick. yeah but you like you have not you didn't have that information in the beginning and yeah i i, th I think that those things should not bother you in a way that like if you cannot control them you don't control the pack two and pack three you don't know what you're gonna open you don't know what's gonna be passed I think those things should not matter in a way that you should like overthink it. Like if if the packs you were taking in the pack one were best, and if you are like confident enough that that lane is open, you should stay to it rather than switching the, the lane. Usually, when I'm switching the lane, is if I don't have the if my pack one was not a road pack and I was struggling in the pack one to find the lane. In that pack, I am gonna. Um, Prioritize the bombs in trying to like at least have a playable deck with a lot of power cards, even though if I end up in playing a third color. But like there is an upside towards that as well. Um the the okay, so let's let's describe the pack. So pack one I would describe it as finding the lane. Pack two, if you didn't find the lane, is you have to find the lane. You you have to know what you're doing in the pack two. So pack two should be described as a way of uh, either like finding a lane if you haven't found the lane, or making sure that your lane was open. Like if you found the lane in pack one, pack two, see if it is open. If it is open, that's great. You you proceed to the pack three. And what's magical about pack three is that pack people should all other know their lane. And at that pack, you can count the wheels. In a way, like you can count the wheels in pack one and pack two, but in pack three, it's magical. Why it is magical? Because if you know that Ragdo, Ragdos was open and you have a Ragdos card and you have a red card and you know your lane was open, you take the red card because you know the Ragdos card is going to wheel to you. So the pack three should be the pack you have the perfect information. You should know what is wheeling and you should know, uh, you should have the, 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 uh, the vision of your deck what you need as well. Like, Advice that I would give every time you're like proceeding into the pack, always ask yourself like few questions. Like the question would be, what do I need? What does the deck miss? Maybe I miss two drops. Maybe I miss three drops. I'm lacking removals. I may be lacking lands. This set is the set where you want to prioritize lands because you want to end up in yes. like having a mana, mana for fix yeah. mana fixing exactly. So like always ask yourself like simple questions before you take your time. Like you have ten seconds before the last pick. Ask yourself like crucial questions, what you're missing, just to like refresh your brain in a way that you have the clear vision what is what what do you need to prioritize and which cards do you need and so on. I think so, as Lola said, it's just to find the gaps in your deck and try to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. But you also need experience to know how to identify those gaps. Do I need more removal? Do I need more two drops? Do I need more late game? Yeah. Do I need a win condition? Which is also important. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lola, Lola described it perfectly. Gaps. 
filling in the gaps. That 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 that's what you need. Uh, how am I looking at a deck? The deck should be like at least in limited. I think this, depending on the set, synergy should be better than the raw power. If your deck is synergistic, it should always win against the deck that is raw power, because synergy at least for me feels like you're getting some value out of nowhere while the raw power is always good but the deck doesn't work together like you just have like a raw powerful deck and that feels good but if you have synergy and you just like do some devastating play and limit and that can happen that feels a bit better and you're you're kind of drafting your deck towards that as well you're drafting in a way that you you kind of have to have a vision of your deck what's happening right you have to know how is your deck gonna perform depending on the match and depending on like are you playing against the aggro deck, control deck, mid-range deck, I don't know, even combo deck. This set has combo decks. This, uh, I mean, it's not combo combo like in. Uh, are you talking about modern... the tools with the double strike? Yeah, oh there my is the guy is so powerful, so powerful. Yeah, the, the, I don't know if you do know this. That kind of thing. That's a combo deck. I did draft this in Bastard Tree. With a Virtuoso, you can kill a person in turn 4. Yes, I watched that in your stream. You had a deck like that. I was like, oh my god, this is actually a thing. Yeah. So, yeah, you connive yeah. him and you increase his power and then you make him unblockable, I think. And yeah, you go bypass. Yes. Yeah, you go... That, so it's like 2 mana, 1-1 one, one double strike. Turn 3, bypass. So bypass says, when you, when you deal the damage, you connive. Trigger goes on the stack from the Virtuos ability, you connive, you want to try to discard an online, he becomes a 2-2. Two -two. You attack for 2, they go to 80, you connive, uh, you try to discard an online again, he goes to 3-3. Three, three. Uh, then double strike, normal strike happens, you deal 3, they're at 15, you connive, you try yet again to discard an online. And then he's a 4-4, four, four. you untap, then like, play the land if you have, you should have a land, like you did see like 4 more cards because you were conniving. And you do go uh, 3 mana, make a creature a 4-4, four, four, base power. And the cool thing about the double striker, he has the plus 1, plus 1 counters. He's not like upgrading his power. Yes. So he becomes like a 7-7 seven, seven double striker. And then when you deal 7 and 8, that's 15, and you have done 5 damage, that's like 20 damage in magic, in limited. That's so, like, nasty, that is the... man. <laughs> yeah, that's nasty. And like, what can you do? Like, if you're drafting that deck, what, what should you do? You should take the key combo piece, piece Piece cards and you should take other cards which would be protecting the stuff like boon of safety one mana one white give a creature a shield counter since like opponent is gonna try to um, stop you from comboing you should have a card that are gonna stop them from interrupting your combo so you you have the vision of your deck you know how the combo works which cards you're gonna prioritize you're gonna pr prioritize boon of safety you're gonna prioritize one blue put up plus one, plus one counter, phase out a creature, counter spell, so on. Because all of those cards help you towards the combo, and then other cards you're going to play, you're maybe going to play the creatures that do have Kunai because they're finding the key pieces and so on. So what? The, deck that, the deck that I had, had the three double strike dudes, he had the three bypasses, and he had the two make a creature a 4-4. Four four. So like it was pretty consistent. Yeah, yeah, make a creature a 4-4. Four four. So it was like pretty con consistent on... Killing people turn four, turn five, depending on the match and how much interaction they have. Holy fuck, that's impressive. I was going to ask about the deck building in this particular case. Because when you make this kind of combo decks, you usually go all in or you go balls very deep into a certain strategy. And sometimes that can come back to hurt you because you are only yeah. limited to the number of picks that you get. I would say that... If you do that with one virtuoso, so the key piece of the combo, of the strategy, it's going to be very inconsistent, but you had three, that's amazing. So, mm -hmm. let's say some one sees one virtuoso, or you see one virtuoso, would you think immediately of building this very focused deck around him? I uh, the risk that if it works, if you draw it, it's very good, but if you don't draw it, you probably have bad cards and you probably lose more games on average than yeah. if you just build a normal deck. So that, that's a good question, like, uh, one thing is to, like, make a combo deck, the other is to make a combo deck work without the combo, right? Yes, exactly. You have, you have to make a deck work without the combo. And cool thing about this is yesterday, um, I was drafting, and pack one, pick one, I opened the Obscura Ascendancy, that's the name of the card, it's like Asper Colors, black, blue, white, and it says when you cast a spell, if it has, like, 
I don't know, I don't know the oracle of the text exactly, but it's like if you cast a spell, if it doesn't have a soul, if it, if the mana cost is the same as the soul counters, make a 2-2. Two, two. And then what you need to do is like cast a 1-drop, 2-drop spell, 3-drop, 4-drop, 5-drop. And yesterday I opened that card pack on pick 1. Thanks God I haven't picked it, because I don't think that card is that good and it should, should try to build around it. But what happened, that card did wheel to, towards me and I was in blue and white already. And I was like, okay, let's pick this card. I cannot lose anything. Other cards are like filler cards. So this is like, I'm taking a card and I'm going to have a higher ceiling if I can make the deck work. And then I was drafting towards the deck and I made the deck. The deck did go 3-0, 6-0. Like the deck didn't lose any match. And the combo card when it did happen was winning the games. So how was I building the deck towards that was I had a good blue-white flyer deck that was winning by just like tempo deck that does play flyers, plays creatures on curve, like uh, good evasion stuff. And when I find the Obscura, I play towards that and I win on the value that that, that card does give. So, getting back to your question, when it comes to Virtuoso and double striking and like bypass combo killing the people turn four, I should not say, I would say if you don't have like the frequently like a lot of those cards and if you cannot make sure that you're playing him on curve, you should go towards building a deck that does work without that card. But when you do have the cards, the combo can win you the game. So, for example, you're most likely going to end up in, like, blue-white flyer decks. You're going to try to, like, have connives. You're going to have... You're going to try to make the deck uh, work without the combo. But when you have the combo, you're going You're going to try to win with that. Luckily for me, because I had a multiple of the same cards, I could have committed more only on the combo. And I was like taking some cards higher because the cards were helping the combo be more consistent or less fragile to their interaction. Um, so the key thing about, I guess, the combo cards in Limited would be, um, does the card work alone? Like, how, how does the card work if you don't have the combo pieces? Like, for example, the two mana double striker is good on its own. You don't even need to cast anything on him. He's good. Like, if you get one counter, two, two double strike, can like end up in like closing the game fast or like it can make a, a bad combat for the opponents as well. So yeah, like it depends on like how the cards individually work and if, if those cards individually can win the game without a combo or like so if they, you can make your deck work without a combo as well. So, so that's the key takeaway to make a deck consistent enough that it doesn't need a combo or this very specific card. But mm -hmm. if you draw it, it's just a cherry on top of something that was already functioning pretty well. Exactly. Th that is the other point of view as well, which would be like, that, that depends on like how good are the cards. Like if you're building a deck towards one card, uh, and you kind of have to have it for your deck to go on, then you want to maybe prioritize some cards that do say draw a card, like look the, look the top three cards, because you're trying to find that card as fast as you can. Like th there are those type of decks as well. Like, right. cards that do help you towards finding the card and making sure that you cast yeah, it yeah. as fast as you can. Then in those type of decks, you would maybe want to have removal because you want to make, you want to stop your opponent from attacking you. So you want to have, like, draw effect cards, you want to have removals, you want to have the cards maybe tutor-like, but there isn't, like, a lot of tutors in limited. Like, there was in Strix Haven, it was limited. So, yeah. But that will be if a card is a real bomb, and the biggest bomb that comes to mind is our blue card tracker for, from Bow. The wolf, yeah, uh, the expert yeah, wolf that puts counters on every creature you have if it's night. That card was completely game breaking if you play it. But it was not a combo, you just play it and that's it. Uh, yeah, play it uh, and that's it. <laughs> that's a, that, that was a bombastic card in the set. Uh, yeah. Towards I, building a deck around that, you would either want to go like either draw cards or like play the normal aggressive build and have that as a finisher, or go play creatures that do help you survive as long as you can because when you. When you drop that bomb, you most likely are going to win, like, yeah, yeah. three or four turns later on. Yeah. One uh, thing that I found interesting also when you were talking about uh, wheeling of the colors, for instance, let's say you are on pack three and you say, you gave the example that you have a red card and you have a Rakdos card and you are on Rakdos, so you first pick the red so that you can wheel the Rakdos because you have the most information that it's going to be an open line. Do you feel yeah. that we, with... It, it, in pack three, we should know that it's open, right? If you are drafting and we know what's open, in pack three, you should know if it is open. If it's not, then you have the information if it's not and you have to take the right card. Yes, you said perfect information. I don't know if I can agree with this because we're talking about humans, so there's never perfect information. People can always change their minds or make a, in quote, stupid pick. 
stupid from our perspective in the sense that it is unexpected. But let's say it's a pack that you have most confidence of all the three, because the highest probability of things being more or less set in stone. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, this is a very good approach and it's very smart. But do you think that with Streets of New Capenna and the fact that the color pairs intersect so much and we have these three color pairs even, is it harder to make these predictions? Streets of New Capenna is a draft that I'm struggling as well. Like it's, it's not like the previous sets, which was easier to read the signals. And um, I wanted to get to this topic because this is this is the topic that would maybe open eyes more to other people and maybe even you yourself. Uh, is that uh, we're gonna get to this question? Let's start this topic, which I think it's re really good uh, way of starting this this topic that you started. Uh, so what I want to say is uh, every pack has every information. And every pack that you're passed, you should read the information you have. What are the informations? You see the rare card, you maybe see uncommon cards, and then the common is gone, right? You can see the common being gone. So like every pack that is passed, you can see a rare gone and you say, hey, they did take a rare, no information. You can never know what they did take from rares. Unless maybe you're drafting in paper and you're like, look. Then you people are doing that in real life. That's like very low. That's cheating, technically. It is it, it is cheating for sure. But yeah, every pack has it, it from it, it has its own information, and the most information comes from commons. Why do I say this? If you get like pick three, pack one, pick three, and you have a rare three uncommons. What do you know? You know, uh, two Just commons. for context, a pack has four com uncommons? Uh, a pack has three uncommons. Three uncommons, one rare, and then... Rare or mythic, commons. and rest is commons, maybe lands. In real life, you can open a foil card, and then the foil card take a, takes a common slot. So then it's going to be like nine commons and a foil card. So your question yeah. was a pack that gets passed as one yeah. rare yeah. and three uncommon. So it has all yeah. the uncommons available. So the All the uncommons and it has the rare as well. Rare so was like something I'm They were probably very limited. good commons. Exactly, they did take a common. And you sh what, what am I trying to say is people should look at that information. That is free information you get during the draft. That cards that are people taking. Like every time I get a pack passed to me, I'm always trying to figure out what is gone. I'm always saying rare uncommons are here. Let's see come on, common is gone. What do I do after that? I go through all five colors. I say blue, white, black, red, green. I try to see if there is one card representing every of these colors. If there is, no signal. You cannot get a signal. But what happens if a blue card is gone? What do you get from that? Yeah, the blue is a really good card. And someone is on blue. Was, someone on your right is in blue. And that's a huge information. Why is that a huge information? People are taking these trap cards. In uh, Limited, there are golden cards. And like somebody is going to pass you blue-black card, but then you check the commons are gone and blue is gone. So if you think about it, that leads to coming to conclusion that that uncommon, which is blue and black, is a trap. Since somebody did take a blue card, but they are not blue and black. They are in blue. And what's going to end up in happening, it's going to end up that they're always going to take the best blue card and they're going to pass you the worst one. And you're maybe going to get the blue cards few rounds, but you're going to end up in train racking because they're always taking the best card. You're always getting the second best or third best or whatever. Maybe they're going to even be more blue. So what am I trying to say is commons give a lot of information. Pack construction gives a lot of information if you want to pay attention to it. And... Of course, sometimes people do take a blue common and in the next few picks you do see something blue and maybe that blue card was great as well. Maybe they change their lane. But like what happens if they don't change the lane is that you have the information while your person or your neighbor is in colors and you can use that as, as, a, mm -hmm. as a knowledge the pack two and the pack three because if they were in, in blue pack one, pack two because they were taking blue cards, you were not passing to your left, maybe they're going to start passing blue cards, you maybe don't want to cut them, or maybe you do, depending on what, what your situation is during the draft, but if you don't cut them, you know that they are going to keep on taking blue cards in pack three, and then you're going to get rewarded. So what am I trying to say is, pay as much as attention as you can 
on the small signals you get. And this, those small signals actually help a lot on reading the table because that's the basic signaling you can get. And a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know that every common should have every color. And that if the one common is gone in one color, that only leads to conclusion that somebody did take it and that you could look at this information. If the next pack has another no blue card, that leads to conclusion they're in blue or they are like forcing the blue. They're cutting the blue. They're sending you a clear signal. And why am I saying this is because like if you read this signal and you respect the signal, you're in pack to not going to prioritize a blue card because like most likely if that person was taking blue cards, person to your left didn't get any blue card. They're passing your blue cards. You're going to be like, oh, blue is open. I'm going to take it now. And that's a wrong approach because somebody did take you, send you like a clear signal. Yes, yes. And if you respect the signal and you keep on passing them blue cards, then they're going to keep on passing you the color they were passing, maybe red. Maybe you were seeing the red cards being great and they were like keeping on passing you red cards. So if you find a friend on the draft, and that's like a good thing. So if I know this guy is in blue, I know I'm in red. I, I'm feeling him blue. He's feeling me red cards. Both me and him are going to end up in having a good deck. That's the thing. You want to have friends in the draft. You don't want to have enemies. You don't want to like uh, hate pick and, and so on. Hate picking is maybe a thing that happens in pod drafts, like if you're going to play against them. But you don't hate pick everything. You hate pick the cards that you're maybe... You don't have anything in the pack. That's when you can hate pick. And you know that you're going to lose to a card. Maybe a board wipe. Something like that. Rare board wipe, somebody passed. You know you're losing. You maybe they can't take it. But I would advise even not taking it. Because if there is a, a single card that is going to end up in your main deck and it has a role, you should take that card over hate picking. Hate picking for me is never uh, a thing that should happen. Because you're hurting so, yeah. yourself. You're, you're to hurting yourself. someone else. Yeah, chances are you can play against them, but like there are huge chances that you're not gonna play against them. Cool thing about limited, you cannot play against your neighbor match one. So like you're always playing against the opposite person sitting. Uh, you're talking about your real life magic because in the yeah, arena, yeah, yeah. it's the people you draft to is, are not the people you're gonna play. It can happen. You can play against somebody that yeah, wasn't your opponent. Random, so so um, you, you, we all we all enter the big pool of players, and you like match up with somebody. So, I'm not sure how it works in Arena, but yeah. So, uh, next time when you're drafting, try to pay attention to that. Trust me, if you do see the color signaling, color signaling on commons gives more, I think the most information in Limited, if not, if not, if not the best. Because, like I said, there are trap picks, and tr people fall for these trap picks, and they're ending up in train racking. Uh, because, like, somebody sent them the signal, they didn't see the signal, and they keep on going for green, they're taking the second best color, and at some point, green does dry up because the person next to yeah. you, of course, is taking the green. And you're like, how is this possible? <laughs> they passed me the good card. And like, no, they didn't. Like, they sent you the clear signal. You were just not paying attention towards it. And that that is always a case for uncommons being in one color, and then you check the commons, no, no color of that, uh, like, if the uncommon is green, and you check the comments, no green comment. Well, that's a that's a, that's a trap pick. You don't want to take the uncommon. That's very interesting. I never thought about that. And that is, in one way, assuming that the common was better than uncommon, or potentially better than common. And in this header, a lot, right? Yes, but let's say you have a really good common. Uh, actually, you have a really good uncommon that is passed to you. And you say, mm -hmm. oh my, how did this car card pass to me? Let's say that white mana to two mana. White card, the crowbar. That you mm -hmm. can sacrifice, create a guy, you can sacrifice to destroy an enchantment. That's one of the best two drops. So let's say you see that on pick two or three or four. And you okay, we see, th we did see that, and there is no white card. Yes. There is a lot of white, but there is a lot of white cards you can take, like inspiring overseer, the two one flyer. I would maybe take that one. I mean, I think it's even correct to take that one angel, the three drop over the crowbar. Like th there is always like. That's the thing that we were talking as well at the beginning. Like I said, like you have to even you have to always pay attention during the draft. You have to realize if you are valuing the cards the same as your opponent. I mean, not opponent. Your friend is. We are all friends on, on the draft. <laughs> Good mindset. So, so uh, you have to realize is your evaluation of cards the same as everyone else's? And why am I saying this? Sometimes you see the signal which I was saying. You see the common color gone. And then at some point, pick eight, you get a bombastic white card. And then you're like, 
you're you're stuck in the middle. Like, hey, what is happening? This guy sent me a signal pick three, and then out of nowhere pick eight to get something huge. And then like you have to ask yourself, how much is he like knowing what he's doing, and should I even listen to his signaling? At that point, like you can even take the card and like punish him in a way that because pack two you're gonna cut him. Like you're gonna end up in white, even though maybe pack three he's gonna go for it. And he's going to be like, hey, man, how are you in that color? And you're like, you were doing something wrong. You maybe didn't see me the send me the clear symbol. But yeah. Lola, uh, sorry, yeah. Lola told me two very interesting things about this. First was about that the people that you draft with are not the people that you play against. But that's kind of obvious because you can play at any hour, not immediately after the draft. But the one, what he also said was that the people that you draft against can be anyone from any rank. So most of them are bronze and silver. Because that's probably the majority of players. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how it works in Marina, and especially best one. I think it's like that. Like you draft with any rank, and then you play against the people that you do end up in playing. But like most likely, they're not gonna be from your pod. But I have seen in best of three at least. I have seen me finishing the deck because there are a lot of people playing best of three, and it's like more likely of you ending up on playing against somebody from your pod, even like somebody that's like was sitting next to you. Uh, so, like, in best of one, I think it's the case that Lolo did describe, but, like, in best of three, uh, I think you can end up in playing against the person that was sitting next to you, and there is there is no ranking there, right? So, yes. like, you can end up in playing against, like, somebody new, somebody... Yeah, it's a question somebody. of probabilities. If you, have, if you have less people playing a format, in this case, the best of three, the chances of you meeting the people you draft against increase. This was, anyway, not the point. It's a question of statistics. Uh, what uh, I wanted to get it is, if they are mm -hmm. low rank, they probably don't understand the game very well. And this is to jump on the assumption that it's maybe not very safe to assume that they will always know what the best picks are. So, you have exactly. a dilemma. As you say, you read the picks very well, as you describe, you try to analyze and collect every piece of information, and you assume that they know what they are doing, but on the other hand, sometimes they don't know what they're doing, and they give you gifts, or they make they pick something that for you doesn't make sense. But probably is here where it comes the what you said that you see one of these gifts and you say, okay, I'll take it, I'll go to this link. Yeah. And what the second thing that Lol also said is that sometimes you need to command the tail. I don't know if you feel this way too, for because in the first pack, let's say you have a guy that is blue on your right and you're not getting blue cards but then you get on pick eight you get this good blue card and at some point maybe you can say okay i'm gonna take you out of blue because then on back two the, the direction will change and you will get the blue cards first than him and you will pass him the second best blue card so do yeah. you feel that you have impose your presence also or do you really just follow the signals all the time and stick to what you're reading i i think i try at least to follow the signals all the time like you did make a good like uh example of getting the pk blue card but like you couldn't even ask yourself how is that possible right if somebody is like if you're confident enough that they know what they're doing and they were like sending you the clearest signal you can ask yourself how is this possible and then like one of the solutions that i could get out of that would be they had two great blue cards and they did take the better one over it and that uh, nobody else on this table is in blue and then the worst thing that i think that could happen is like i think the worst thing that happens in limited is me and the person next to me being in the same colors that's like i think the worst thing happening because like the person that is sending more packs which would be the like people on your left, I'm better off because I'm sending them two packs, they're sending me one. I'm like profitable more than, than they are because I'm sending them two times the worst cards out of the best of the blue cards. <laughs> so like sometimes like you can see the signal, you can ask yourself, okay, maybe they switch the lane, maybe they're not st like sticking to the signal. Or if they were consistent enough, I think the solution would be, okay, they just got the two best blue cards, no one else is in blue on this table. Maybe it's still not the best for me to enter in blue. Let's keep on pushing the cards to the left. Maybe somebody else is going to be in that color and let them fight for the colors rather than me like trying to fight with my neighbor. Uh, I honestly think that two people that are sitting next to each other and if they are ac actively trying to send the clear signals and trying to help each other, they're going to end up in having a better draft deck than anyone else in the table. 
since if 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 both of those know which colors they are in and they're like um appreciating each other in a way that they are not cutting the, each other they're like sending the cards and like both of them are getting the enough playables both of those are gonna end up in having a better deck than both of them fighting for the for the same color so um uh, yeah. i would say like like try actively to read the signals and try to make a answer for what what is happening on the draft uh, I okay i did I did interrupt you on the previous question. Do you want to get back to the this set and drafting? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a long detour. <laughs> but it's very interesting. Yeah, uh, good that you remember that. I actually did not remember that question anymore. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go so I, I, I wanted to finish it because it's really interesting. And I wanted to give the heads up. Because we were talking about how can you use your draft as the knowledge when it comes to commons and reading the signal. This set is interesting. And why yes. is this set interesting? The colors mix, yeah. Uh, because there are three color cards. And yet again, there is the common signaling. There is color sim signaling that there has to be blue, black, red, green, white. But what is interesting in this set is that the, the card that does represent the white doesn't need to be a single white. It can be a three color. So like it, one of the three colors is white. So you can have like, you can have like, Two single color black cards, two single color green cards, two single color white cards, blue cards, and there is non single color red card, but there is the Naya dude that does make a 5 3. And that card in the pack is representing the red. So this set is way more difficult than reading the signals because you don't, when you get the pack passed to you, even if you do see a single color red card gone, there is a three color card, and you have to determine which that three color card is representing in the pack. Uh, right. I don't know if you did, did I understand. understand. So you're saying that one color in a three color pair is enough to make that color representative. Meaning that yeah. if you have one red in a jeweled card, which is a green, red, black. Black. That yeah. red, that symbol in the three colors is enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I find it this surprising. Since I was expect I was thinking usually more in terms of two or in terms of a pair. So I will mm -hmm. usually think of uh, a pair that can be splashed to a third. But I would, for instance, if I was in white, or if I was just in black, maybe I would not force two extra colors. I would not force no. the red and the green. So it's interesting yeah. that you say that one color is significant to shift your analysis. Uh, I'm just saying that, wh why am I saying this? Is because like, the knowledge that you can use in the draft, which is like reading the commons and reading the, the colors, it's way harder in this set because like one card can represent three colors and you have to determine which color it is representing, right? Since like you can get the pack pass, like pick five, and you can see white color single card, you can see blue card and black card, and there is none red and green card, but there is the Naya card. And then you have to determine which color it is representing in the pack. Is it red or green? And honestly, you cannot determine. Okay. And then like, it's way harder for you to read the signals from commons. Like that, that's the thing about this set and why am I struggling? Because like, you don't have the, uh, you don't have that, how would I say it? Acid in your tools. Or, your you, you don't have, on your confidence, maybe? Yeah. Maybe that would be the word to describe it. So you don't have that knowledge which you would have in other sets. Like previous example would be the Kamigawa. In the Kamigawa, there was supposed to be every every color in every common. But the cool thing was the sagas could represent the common and the color. So like, I don't know if you remember the previous set. The previous set was there had to be like three uncommons, one rare and commons. And then one slot for saga. Yes. The cool thing about the saga was, if the saga was in common slot, it could represent the white. So, like, they in commons, like, there could be non-white cards and the saga is white. And then the saga is representing common color signaling. Uh, Interesting. But, yeah, this set is way harder on reading the signals. Why is it that? Because, like, you cannot use this as your tool. You cannot look at the commons and determine what colors are your people right when you're drafting unless you do see like three colors and you don't see a golden card. Then you can say, hey, they're in blue. That's the only only time in this set where you can say it. But it's the three color cards, two color cards are making it more of a mess for when it comes to signaling. Um, this set is interesting. 
for a few reasons. Because I think most of the time people try to end up in three colors because like this set was uh, represented towards us as a three color set and like playing the three colors. And the way that I'm in pro approaching the draft is I try to end up in one color. After one color drying up, I try to realize what is the second best color from the cards that I'm being passed. Then I'm in two colors, like for example, I am white and green. And then you have two roads. First road would be ending up in white and green, which is great. I think it's always best to have two color deck than three color deck. The reason would be because um, consistency. I think the consistency right. in limited is better than the power. You can have powerful cards, but if you don't have mana playing the powerful cards, it ends up when you're losing the game or not. If your deck has the consistency, and it has the power, that would be if you're playing three colors and you have the mana to support three colors, that decks are better because you have the more colors and you have more cards in your pool that you could be playing and, and like you can play uh, more of the cyber cards and so on. Uh, but when it comes to approaching the draft, I'm always trying to stay in one color as much as I can, then jump into the new color when I have to jump or one color did dry up. And then after that, if I know that I'm like white and green and white and green was most open, and at some point I don't have enough playables or I'm missing the power and I have the lands that help do support the fixing because I was like prioritizing mm -hmm. lands, then you can take the third color cards. And that would be maybe blue cards and you're in Bunt or you're taking the red cards and you're in Naya. So that's how I'm approaching the drafts at the moment. In Capena, do you focus on the color pairs that are allied? And allied in this case means that they are prepared to work together. In this case, Slesnia, the green and white. And mm -hmm. a pair that is not represented in this set is the Orzhov pair, the black and white. You don't have lands that give black and white. You only have lands that give black, white and blue, for instance, which is Esper or Obscura, I believe. Mm -hmm. So would you try to be on these pairs that Wizards made to be predictable and then maybe at the third one that also matches well the expected free color. Yeah, uh, I think that you sh should be drafting the allied colors. The reason is because there is payoffs to being in them in a way that there are good golden cards, like for example, green and white. If I am green and white, there could be cards being passed towards me that are just green and white, and those cards are powerful. Rather than being in Orzov and not getting any golden card passed to me, right? Because there is not an Orzov card that could be passed to you. So, but I'm not saying that this set could not be played as you described it. You could end up in having a black-white deck function. But yes. uh, there would be less synergy in that. Right. It would just be, that's the desc description of a raw power. That would be, you were taking the best black cards, you were taking the best white cards, and the draft was ending up that you didn't find the third lane, and you were just ending up in Orzo, which would be black and white. And that's not wrong. You should play that, and that deck should win. But I think that that deck should lose to a synergistic that deck that does have a lot of synergy that can be the raw power that those two colors can be. Um, That's why I think it that could happen if you're, for instance, trying to go Esper and you don't find the blue cards and you get like halfway. So you get in this awkward position that you did not complete the synergy, but you have a lot of raw cards that might yeah. work as a standalone. In this yeah. case, in this set, do you try to force any color pair or do you usually continue to read the signals and can pick whatever? That, that, that's a good question because like uh, first week of the set people were saying the bunt is the best color anybody that's not drafting bunt they're doing something wrong and that is just against my way of drafting. Of course there is a color bias in a way that you would like ending up in one color but I am the person that just wants to end up in drafting the color that is most open on the table. Since I think there is color biased, of course, and there is soft forcing. If you're forcing and you want to end up in Bunt, and Bunt has like 60% win rate or something like that, oh. you, could, you could do it. Uh, it. Maybe the numbers are wrong. It was best like of one like or best of three? I think both. Like it was crazy high how, how oh, Bunt was very like. High, yeah. How 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 Bunt was like uh, on another level? It's crazy, to especially if everyone is is kind of forcing it or soft pushing, because the uh, the higher number of people going on it means that also bad people are trying to draft it, which should lower the win rate. 
So exactly. if you have sixty percent on a color pair or, that everyone is doing, it's very high. Yeah, it means that the color pair is good, especially if you're the only one drafting it. Like yeah. you're gonna have a monstrosity of a deck. The reason why the bond colors like I'm trying to like everything should be described and you should have the answer why for, for me like if people tell me okay bunt is but ha bunt has the highest win rate can you re like explain me why i'm just gonna tell them the reason why the bunt decks are good is because commons and uncommons are strong and you can make the deck work with commons and uncommons you don't need the rares you don't need the bombs just the 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 cards that are glue or should be the glue are really powerful like the two one flyer that does draw a card jewel thief that makes a treasure I don't know, three color cards in those colors are strong. The double, two one double striker is like impossible to it's, deal with. It's for in, shield combat. Counter, the card is broken. I lost to it another yeah. day. Like, it completely carries again. And, and that's and that's why the bond colors are strong because like commons and uncommons are so strong if you're in that. But like, what am I saying is like, what happens if like three people have that perspective and three of them are drafting? All three are gonna most likely end up in having a deck. But that deck is not as strong as somebody that was just like drafting Grixix colors. If they were just blue, black, and red, for example, or a true color deck, which would be better, maybe Ragdos. Ragdos, aggressive deck. So, and that's that's the way I'm looking. I have color biased. I could end up in Bunt if if the table is passing me the cards and I see seem like the my cards are like lining up in a way that I want to end up there. But I'm not forcing. If the Ragdos is open, I'm going to switch to Ragdos and I'm going to play the Ragdos. One of the days, uh, like in past, like uh, it was like maybe week one, I started with like 2-1 Angel into uh, Pets. I think that's the name of the card. Azorius card that does make 2-1 ones. The Exotic Fish. Fishes. Yeah, the, so that's the card. So you Angelic Overseer into Exotic Fish. Exotic yeah. Pets, sorry. Yeah. And I kept on taking the cards, and then at some moment, I got like pick six or pick seven Ragdos card. And I remember that in my pack, there were some good Ragdos cards. And at that moment, there wasn't anything good in white and blue, and like white and blue was a bit getting cut. Yeah, yeah. And I did take that one. So fast forward, I abound in blue and white, and I was just taking Ragdos cards. And I end up with a, maybe one of the most broken decks I had in this uh, set, which had like, uh, were you playing AFR back in the days? Uh, that no, was the D &D I only set. started in Arena back in Havnik, and now I restarted in Midnight Hunt. So I didn't see okay. AFR. So, so what happened AFR, with AFR? AFR was like uh, set familiar with Act of Treason. The Act of Treason take control of a creature oh, that the really opponent controls. Really. And cool thing about that said, there are a lot of things that do say sacrifice a creature. So you're always taking control of their best creature and sacking it. So like Act of Treason was a removal. This set has that card the same. It has four mana, take control of a creature and make a treasure. And like casualty spells work great with them, right? Because you can take control of their creatures, sack their creature, kill two of their new creatures. And then like you use two cards to kill three of their cards. That's dirty, man. Yeah, that dirty. is dirty. But... That's the uncommon card. It's kind of hard to get the Act of Treason these days because it's uncommon, it's not a common. In AFR, it was common. And do people do remember how strong it was? But like, what am I trying to say is, in that draft that I was started um, Azorius, I switched to Ragdos because I was getting all the key cards. So I would say in this set, if you see the key cards wheel, you should not feel frightened enough to take them, speculate on them if you did remember the previous packs, and just abound in everything that you were going and just like switching the switching the rail and going for a new strategy. So like two color cards, three color cards could be a representation of a color pair or an archetype being open. But I would honestly say maybe two color is more of a representation than a three color. Um, right, because a two color is easier to take than a three color. Is that exactly? Reasonable? Yeah, if they're like in blue and they pass me a Dimir card. Most likely they are they are not in black, or they are not none of those two colors. But if somebody passes me three color card and I'm like, hey, is this archetype open? I cannot say with gratitude that blue, black, or red are open on this table. I can maybe say that this maestro card no one is in, but it doesn't tell me that blue, black, or red are not right. open, or that no one is drafting it. So what it seems to me that you said is that you challenge the notion that the bond the white, green, and blue being better in absolute was something that required some context because from your perspective, 
it seems that no color is best out, outside context. Just it seems just that it is best because since it has the best commons and uncommons, you can make the most consistent deck. Yeah, because you can you make the need, average. Yes, on average. Yeah, average deck. Yeah, average deck there is stronger than the average deck maybe in other colors. But what am I trying to say? And with the with somebody that was drafting like a lot of gruel and people were like uh, saying bad things about about gruel, like they were like denying it being a color pair. Like if 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 the color pair is open and you get a lot of key cards, uncommons, rares, mythics, whatever, you get a key card in that color. That color should be stronger because the synergy is better in that than just the raw power that the band cards do here. So I'm, I'm look for, like, if you have the and the rare and uncommon, especially in other color pairs, you should go for them because if you have these key pieces, any color pair might work. And you opened my mind to this possibility. I was in the beginning. I was I played my first draft of this set, and by ac kind of by accident, I ended up in Silesia, just green and white, mm -hmm. and it was very strong. I still rolled it. It was like seven zero or seven one. I, I mean, like the two mana two three cat that does get life. Yes. Like three three life in curly on is like hard to race and it goes too well. I started with those. I'm like, this card seems good. I took those. I ended up Silesia, complete strong. Next uh, draft, I tried other color pair because I didn't find these the Silesia guys, and I went like. Uh, one free. I was like, oh, this color sucks. The fourth draft, I kind of soft forced at Silesnia and I went 7 2 again. I was like, oh my god, this, this color is broken. It's just the, the solution is to always do this. And then I saw your stream and I saw your approach to the set and you said, no, every color pair works. And you gave this example of Gruel and you had, I think, a lot of Gruel decks it was that you had picked. And they all had yeah. good win rates. I was like, okay, maybe this approach is not so simple like this. And then I started yeah. to take the Junes and so on, and I got, again, seven wins with Junes, because I got, for instance, a good card, a good Junes card, a Ziatora. Or it was open. Yes. It was open. You had the deck that was open. Yes. And that's also the thing. If you, people, Many people think that one color is the best. They will outcompete each other, and they will leave the, the other colors open. So it's kind of good if... People believe that something is meta when it actually is not. It appears that in drafting there's not real meta, there's just context, and that's how you adapt to that context. There's exactly. The, it depends on the setting, it depends on people that are drafting with you. you there is a lot, a lot of things yeah. that so come with will, every draft. You will be a guy not to force a color? No, no. no. Like I will have the I will have the bias, like if I if I start with a two one angel, the 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 flyer in white. And then I get past like an average black card, and I get past like an average green and white card. I'm gonna go for green and white card because like it goes well with the other card they did take, and I know that co that color pair is fine. But if I see like a lot of other co like I don't have a lane, and I do see the lane that seems open, I'm gonna try to end up in there because like a it's open. I'm gonna get every best maybe archetype card in that pack, and I'm gonna get like a lot of other filler commons in that co in that color and so on. So. I honestly think that every combination of colors is strong in this set. Uh, one are maybe easier to make than the other. Like I said, Celestia and Bunt works with weaker cards because the strongs, the, the cards that are strong are common and they are really powerful and you can make the, the deck work with the commons. Uh, but I, I would not say that that deck is best in a way that it can beat any deck. It cannot beat any deck. Every, every other color pair has its own solution towards that. It just depends on like how many of those solutions could they have picked and how many of those key, how their deck is looking like, how their deck is strong individually comparing to other. So I would say at this moment, I might be wrong. Maybe in like a month, I'm going to like regret what I'm saying, but I would say that this feels at least now that it is a balanced set. It feels, even though, Bond colors are strong, and they have a lot of good rares. That doesn't mean that you cannot beat them. Like, they have a lot of good creatures on 2 and 3. They are good because they are uh, they are aggressive deck. They have a lot of tempo plays. Like, they, they play a lot of power uh, on the early stages. Like, if they play a double striker turn 3 with a shield, that's a tough spot you're in immediately. But what can you do if you're not a Bond colors? You can either try to race with them, if that's possible, or if you're Ragdos, you're going to have a good time because you're going to st steal their creature, attack them for four, then sack it. 
or like if you're in black, you have minus three, minus three. So there is like a lot of cards that do play around each other. Like it's not like previous set, which was Crimson Wound, somebody slams a bomb, you lose a game because like you have one turn to deal with it. And the set didn't have a lot of cards that can actually deal with the card. I think this set has a lot of cards, it has a lot of solution. It just depends on like how you drafted the deck and if the deck you drafted maybe was the most open. If you have like uh, unique tools to play against each color and each each problematic deck. So would you say that it's somewhere halfway between Vow and Neo? Because Vow was very bomb heavy and Neo was very synergistic heavy. It was an amazing set to, to play. So this seems uh, to be a bit bomb, yeah. but you at the same time you have the answers and you have the small nuances and the small interactions to make it a bit more complex than just dropping the ball. Yeah, it is interesting. This one, comparing to Crimson Wall, I would say the commons are pushed. Commons are strong and they feel bombastic. Rares on commons, mythics, depending on the card, there are some rares that are just like a, another card you take over a common. Like you, you take a, a good single color common over a two color or three color card, which might be a bomb, but like you don't know if you're going to end up and you just take a common, which is like 99%, like a, a really good card and maybe the best card you can have in a color. Like you can find a common in this set that does represent the color. And you're like, if I'm in this color, I would want to have as many as I can of this card. Like a yeah. Tronk? <laughs> yeah, Tronk is one, for example. Like the, the, Those ones are like great yeah. if you have any multiples. I'm not sure like uh, when it does get the, I think this is the word, diminishing returns. Like, maybe at some point you have a lot and it's maybe not the best to play that many. Maybe after I, five I, or something. Maybe something like that. I played four and four was really good. It's broken, man. Like, play one, you get three others. No yeah, chance. The yeah. thing is, it has free power. And free power is a lot. It kills almost it, everything. It was a, like, since I'm part of the Draft Lab member, and shout out to Draft Lab, the other awesome content creators, which maybe you should get the interview as well. Sure. Uh, but we are doing the tier list. And every time that we get to see new cards, it's hard to evaluate how the card is going to perform. And we, when we did see the Tronk, at least from my perspective, I did think that it's not going to be the best card. And the reason behind why I did think that it's not going to be the best card is because I was looking the card as the card. So if you are an aggressive deck and you play turn three, the three one, that does like draw you two more three ones, Three ones get blocked by the one ones. And then, like, if you have that way of looking, you're like, hey, this is not the, the best. And then, like, if you play the turn four, the three one again, you didn't, like, upgrade your board status, right? The three one is not, like, attacking good, and you just, like, used four mana to play a three drop again. If you do the on turn five again, the same thing, it's not the best. But, like, when you play the set and you get, when you get, like, more uh, information about it, then you realize that 3-1 is an amazing blocker. And it does have a lot of synergies with it because it's a citizen. And then the fact that it's a 3-for-1 card. And this set does seem like value dependent as well. In a way that you can either connive it, you can like chump block, like it has citizen synergy. Like there is a lot that you can do with a Tronk. So that Tronk was an example of a card that I um, screwed up on rating. Like I gave it a D plus. Now it's a C plus for me. Like the card even could go to B minus, but I would not go that high. I have like a hierarchy of cards. How I'm rating. The thing is, that card needs many others to be good, so you cannot rate it individually. Like, yeah, it's one it gets strong better a B, or is five strongs a B. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, but yeah, for so sure. Like, yeah. Oh, uh, our perspective changes, and it's interesting how even for someone as experienced as you, has given a lot of thought to how to evaluate and how to assess how good a card is in limited, you still overlook mm -hmm. these aspects that probably only come from the actual experience of drafting the set and detecting these small energies, like being a citizen. Like how important is it to be a citizen? In this case, it's very important because it interacts with other cards. Other cards, that there is like equipment, three mana, one to equip a citizen, plus two, plus one trample. Yeah, and then if right. the... And then if the trunk has five power, then like it trades with even more stuff. Um, if you're into data and other people that maybe are going to watch this, I highly recommend you checking out Sirkowitz. He's the person that is like putting a lot of data and I'm always checking him out when the new set releases. Reason behind it is because like he does the percentages of how much the damage based removals are killing stuff. 
So oh, like I have a better, I have yeah, I have a better way of looking at the set when I'm rating the cards as well because I see hey how much does the three damage kill the set, and then he like does it for this set and he even compares it to pre to a previous one. So like I think that this set three damage kills around seventy percent or eighty percent. Common cards, yeah, that's that's a lot. That's a very then, interesting like, uh, way to look at it because it tells you in percentage what's the probability of it being a dead card or not being a dead card. Because if it kills yeah. seventy percent of the set, then chances are you almost always it, find a good use for it. Good use for it, and it's gonna be a good card to have. Yeah, and then like it's a good thing to actually check out how the damage does align towards the set, like especially the one damage ones. Like those ones are hard to rate because. One damage doesn't kill a lot, but if you have a way of looking that it does kill 30%, and then you can maybe manipulate it in a way that average power and toughness of a creature maybe is like 3 or 4, or I don't know, lower toughness, 4 and 5, like maybe you can find a better use usage of it. So one, one good thing to actually check out every time that... Could you repeat his name more slowly, please? Uh, Sir Kovitz, I think. Okay. Just to... I'm sorry, Sirkovitz, if I pronounce your name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna watch this. Okay, I'll check it. It's a very interesting approach. And as I'm someone from data science, I value a lot these data insights. And yeah, he he is data analytic person. Not sure what is his uh, uh, working field, yeah, yeah. but I I think he has like a lot okay. of data knowledge. Just a, a final topic to wrap this up. If uh, you don't think about color strengths in this set, do you think about uh, types of deck? Let's say aggro tempo, because the idea that was at the beginning of this set was that it was aggro oriented, or at most oh, mid range yeah. oriented. Oh yeah, I thought that it was a slow. People were looking at it, so I was at least looking at a slow set. At least I was hearing some people say that they were afraid <laughs> that best of one could turn into a shit show because you had to force Rackland. It was by far, supposedly, the best aggro strategy that would stomp all the others. As sometimes happened in some sets, sometimes one call is really the best pair and you just, especially in best of one where you don't have sideboard, you just pick it, it's very aggressive and you finish all the decks. Uh, do you feel... So, okay, how do you feel about the approach to the deck building? Yeah, so... Uh... How am I looking at this set is really interesting because I think this is a really tempo oriented format in a way that if you lose the tempo early in the stage and your deck is not designed on getting back, you're going to lose the match. So like it, when it comes to deck building, you want to have cards that can help you on sustaining the tempo and helping you out. Um, it can be aggressive depending on who are you playing against, but like it's super interesting because People that are playing three colors, they kind of have to develop the time in fixing their lands. And there is a lot of tap lands that people are playing. Like people end up in playing six plus tap lands because they want to have the mana base settled and they want to be able on playing their bomb cards. Um, one thing that I found interesting in this set comparing to others is that tricks and combat tricks are better than they were in the past. Like I'm not a big fan of combat tricks in general. Because uh, skilled player can realize what you're trying to do. Like if you are attacking with a three power into five toughness, they can determine what is happening. It can end up in being a bluff, but you can realize it from the way that they were playing that maybe it wasn't a bluff. So in past, combo tricks weren't good because they are uh, vulnerable in a way that uh, you're opening yourself for a two for one. You're casting a trick on your creature, they cast a removal, they took a combo trick, and they took your creature away. So it was easy to play around them. But what is interesting in this set is that 1 mana plus 2 plus 2 or plus 4 plus 4 is better is because at earlier stage there aren't many cards that can interact with that. Like in a way that there are way less instant removal that can punish you. So that leads on like you playing more combo tricks and maybe more equipment. Uh, for example, one of the good good equipments is the three mana colorless that does give first strike and plus one plus one, since it works in combat. And oh, that the, does the build dagger. yes yeah the dagger yeah, and that does build a lot of pressure because all of a sudden you attacked, they blocked, you use the dagger, you saved your creature, you took their creature away, and your and your creature becomes a bit bigger. 
And when it comes to one mana tricks, you can double spell with them. You can win the combat early on, and you can like keep on building the board, because one mana, most likely if you attack turn three, you can either play a two drop, or later on, you can maybe play a three or a four if it is a turn four or five. And those cards do win the combat, because like plus two, plus two, on average size creature at that moment should win in a way that your creature does survive. So this set does re like reward people playing more uh, tempo oriented cards, which are those combat tricks for one mana, because you make a lot of pressure early on for a small amount of price, mm -hmm. and those cards can work in a way that they can finish the game as well. Like plus four, plus one on one unblockable creature can win you the game. Um, so in this set, I kind of value combat tricks more because I know it's super important to play against them as well. Like if they want to use a combat trick, I can have mine and then maybe the for one red, plus one plus oh, first strike is not as bad because it's either going to do A, it's going to remove a shield counter, like if you double block, this is a cool interaction. You double block, you put one first strike on one, first strike takes a shield counter, then your normal creature trades with their creature. They did have a shield counter. That's like one way of dealing with that. Or like, which I did see, one red, first strike, it like, people would not in general play around it because it cards seem unplayable because you're opening yourself for two for one. In this sets are a bit better. And it's not like, uh, you should not feel bad if you're including that card in, towards your deck decision, or even boarding it in against somebody. Because like it's really tempo oriented. If you lose the tempo, if you lose the board presence in people, and the person does keep on building the board, keeps on pulling, pulling the pressure, um, most likely they're going to end up in winning. So I would say that this set feels a bit snowball-y in a way that if they start rolling the ball and you cannot stop them, and it's really hard to stop the rolling the board, especially if they, if you're looking at it, if the one mana trick trades with a four mana card that you played, yes. that's like a lot of value because they can end up in double spelling and so on. So you kind of have to find a way of like stopping their ball or fight against them in a way that you're going to have or use your life as a resource. This do is the, an interesting... Yeah, hmm? do the shield counters in one way contribute to that snowballing effect? Because if you are behind, you have to work double as hard to remove a creature from the board. At the same time that they reward you for using combat tricks, since they lower the risk of your remove of an opponent having removal and you're wasting a two for one. So let's say they have a remo use a trick and they use a removal. If you have a shield yeah, counter, you have one layer of safety. Yeah. So shield counters are interesting. Uh, at least those ones I did nail when it comes to like figuring out how they're gonna... The broken, um, man, to be honest. They're very hard to wait, yeah. deal with. So, one of my friends did tell me that they are uh, acting as 80% of a card. So, like, in one card you have an 80% more because of the shield counter. And I, when I was looking at the shield, I was like, this seems always as a two for one. Because, like, they're either gonna need to chomp, they're either gonna need to use a removal if it's something something like a bomb, or, like, you're gonna attack, they chomp. Like, it's so hard to, like, remove a shield counter without losing a resource. And unless it is, like, chomp blocking in a way that your creature is bigger. But, like, on first place, they're not gonna attack if that's the case. Unless you flash in the creature. That's why the 2 5 is so good. It does give the value, but it can take, like, a. A creature on the flash and so on. Yeah. So shield counters are super difficult to play against. And they do reward the tricks that you were describing because you have the one layer of safety if you're gonna use it in them. But that does reward the other things more. It does reward the, the cards that go under the shield, like the minus three, minus three, minus four, minus four. Witness protection. Witness protection is one good example of a card that's one mana deal with anything. Card is maybe not the best if you're looking at it's the only way of using the removal. But like, if your deck is built around that you're not gonna feel the 1-1, one -one, you cast that card even on the shield creatures and you don't care that that 1-1 one -one has a shield. It's gonna act as a chump blocker. 1-1 right. one -one doesn't attack into you. So like, they're gonna chump block once, but you were efficient with your mana because with one mana you dealt with a threat. And you don't care about the shield because Shield doesn't end up in mattering on the one one. Like they're gonna chomp, they're gonna save some life. It's fine by you. If you if you stop their pressure or you if you keep on building your pressure, one mana cards are powerful because like I said, they let you on double spelling. 
Uh, one of the examples of the decks that do a lot of witness protection would be the evasion decks. Since that's one mana removal, you take away their flyer that doesn't block your flyers, and you're playing the cards like a 0, 4, 1, 3, and so on, that are good walls on the ground that the one ones don't pass. How do you take and away that's... their flyer shield? Since the unlucky witness is a ground guy. So uh, how do you, are you assuming that they will block with their flyers that have a shield? No, no. So witness, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, I'm, no, how... or I'm mistaking that card with unlucky witness. So, Witness Protection says, make a creature a 1-1, one, one, it loses all abilities. Oh, it I'm sorry, I just took it with the red card that is Unlucky Witness, that is a 1-1 one, one for 1 mana, that when it ties, ah. you, use, you reveal the top 2 cards until next turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so, yeah. Oh, and, okay. So witness, pro witness Protection is like a good way of dealing with the bombs, or like building on, up the tempo, because like it can allow you to attack, or if you're losing the tempo, getting back in the game with it. I'm not like saying that people should play 20 of them. Those cards are, aren't meant to be played 20. Maybe one off, two off, depending on the deck. Or even better, which I do, I love them in the cyber. I take them in the cyber and I know that I'm going to find a match where it's going to be great. Uh, it all depends on like how, how are you looking at your deck and what is the goal of your deck. Winning the game fast, getting into late game, outvaluing the opponent when you do get to the late game, and so on. But yeah. So witness protection, it makes a creature a one one and loses abilities. It was loses abilities, yeah. So it it will lose the flying if you put it on their flying creature. So if you if you want to pass with your flyer and they have a flyer blocker, you cast the witness protection, you turn it into one one, and it doesn't have flying. Uh, but if you cast it on the creature that does have shield, shield is not a part of the text of a creature. It's like a counter. Creatures enter with a counter, and all the counters stay on the creature even though they are witness protection. But like I said, if you do cast that on a card that's like a 5-5, five, five, you don't even care if it does have a witness, right, if it does right, have right, a counter, right. because you have dealt with a threat. The right. threat was a 5-5, five, five, and one mana dealt with a threat. So that's a very interesting approach. We're kind of reaching the end. I don't want to take any more time from you. It was amazing to talk to you. I think you have a really unique perspective and you shared really unique information that I didn't know about. Such I'm as... glad. That's, that's the whole point. That's the reason why I started streaming in a way that I can maybe improve. I definitely did, did improve when it comes to talking on English. Like At the beginning of my streaming career, I, I did have hard times speaking. It's hard even now. Like I'm not like speaking. that much... Uh, or speaking. Speaking. Oh, speaking. Yeah. So even now, like I'm not that much confident enough in my uh, language, but I got getting, am getting better. But the reason why I started is sharing the knowledge. Like, what can a Serbian guy can maybe teach you that are from somewhere else? What do I know, and what have I gathered during playing Magic and so on? About the language, I've told you many times. I think that you should be more confident in your skills. I, you speak really well, and you explain yourself really well. And you also have a great accent. We were talking about this <laughs> offline. That we don't yeah. need to speak good, good, perfect British English or American English, but you have a very cool Eastern accent. So <laughs> don't be afraid of how people understand. You communicate really well. And yeah, the that, 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 that's the thing I'm always scared. Somebody misunderstanding me, misinterpret... Uh, okay, this is a hard word. This is interpreting. Yeah. I, that, that's the thing that I don't want to like. That, that I don't want to happen, so I have like a lot of stress when I'm trying to choose the words, and, and I try to describe myself and be like as much uh, precise as I can when I'm trying to say something. So yeah, yeah, and it also shows that you are a, a pro player, or, or you have this pro career experience. If you have this really competitive and specific uh, mindset of really counting the cards, of improving yourself, of, folk, of not depending on assistance, of even looking at others as their friends, not as direct opponents. That's also a beautiful way to put it. Uh, but you had a lot of things. You bring a lot of things to the conversation, and I had really a lot of fun, and I learned a lot speaking to you. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your experience. How can people follow you and watch you and continue to learn from you? Okay. Uh, if you want to learn from me, I would do the other thing because like I'm a part of a big community named Draft Lab. What, what is the first step you can do is maybe join our Discord. Uh, that's an awesome limited community named Draft Lab run by six of us streamers. It was like two at the beginning, now we are six. 
and we're like building our community every day. We're trying to share as much knowledge as we can in a way by like typing and like uh, giving ideas and so on. And it's not only us, honestly. It's like even more. It's like the community as well. We have like around 1K members at the moment. So like the thing that that we do like is like seeing new people join and like actively trying to discuss and all of us like it's not like somebody teaching somebody it's all of us trying to learn from each other and like try to see what's working and what's not so i would advise like everyone else if they are interested in limited and getting better to join the discord and oh. then there they can uh, and then there can find the other great streamers which would be florida man Iki, josh the four Tad jordan and then at the end myself so all of us are like the streamers of the draft lab so if you like me i would advise you everyone else first to check out them then at the end you can check out me as well if you would like that all right and you also but, stream on twitch yeah i still stream on twitch name is ekil tv uh i i pronounce it like this every time somebody asks me how you pr how do you pronounce your name and i'm like i don't know <laughs> like it, you're, you're asking a non-native speaker how do they pronounce the name they, they just type i'm pronouncing it ekil it's e K I L T V, right? And yes, yeah, like on my assumption. I would say Hekil, or I refer to you as Hekil. So in my ignorance, yeah, I, it seems correct. Yeah, <laughs> I always say Hekil, and there are like some other streamers which we are always like joking about, it, and they were like, "How do I even pronounce your name?" Like, you just join my chat, and I'm like, "Oh, I don't know how to say it," <laughs> and I'm like, "However you feel, man. I I don't find it like uh, right, offensive man. or anything." All right, man. Thank you so much, and best of luck for the news for the new sets and continue rolling and steam rolling all the news. <laughs> Thank you, man. See you, man. Yeah.